Hey, what's up? Jason here from Unity3D.College. Today we're going to talk about linear interpolation. Now, if you read the description on the Wikipedia page, you may get a little bit lost and confused. Don't worry, I'm going to go over it in a real practical, simple example and show you exactly how to use this. So here we are with a Unity project, and I've got this intlerp demo game object with just an intlerp demo script on it. And I've got a start value and an end value and then this little slider to slide along the percent. And watch as I slide it down, and then we'll dive right into the code. So right now it's at one, and our final value is 50. If I go down to zero for the percent, it goes to zero. Might make a little bit of sense, right? It's going from the start to the end based on a percent. So if I went to 0.5, exactly, you'd expect a 25, because that's halfway in between the start and the end value. Now if I change the end value here, set that up to 100, Notice the final value instantly changed to 50 because that's halfway between 0 and 50. If I change the start value to 50, we'll get a 75 because it's right in between. And then we'll, we'd be dragging from 50 to 1. So let's take a look at the code, see how it works, and then we'll start looking at some of these game objects and a couple more, slightly more advanced linear interpolation demos. So here's the script. Now, the first thing I wanted to point out is that we do have the edit and execute mode attribute on here. That's why this value is changing as I go up and down when I'm not playing. Otherwise, without that, I would have to play to get that value to actually change. But since it's a demo, just throwing the edit in, or execute in edit mode in there just makes it work. So here we have our two floats. We have a start and an end value. Those are what you saw in the inspector. Serialized field attribute makes them show up in the inspector because they're private. If they were public, they'd show up there, but generally better to keep them private and use this attribute so that they're not publicly accessible to other classes. And then we have this lerp percent float. And notice how it was a slider that went from zero to one. That's because of this range attribute. We can put whatever values we want there on a slider, but for a lerp, it makes sense to go from zero to one because that's what we pass in. And then finally, we have this public float for final value. This one I didn't make a serialized field just to kind of show that this also shows it in the inspector. Plus this may be like a value that we'd want to read outside this class. I don't know. Just seemed seemed like a good idea to do that. Anyway, in our update method, we're setting the final value to mathf.lerp and here we pass in that start value and the end value and then that percent. So it's pretty simple, right? We just give it a start, the minimum, we give it an end with the max and then a percent to go in between there. There are some other things that we could do though. For instance, lerp unclamped. Let's take a look at that. I just changed it there and I'm going to adjust this range now. I'm going to change this to like negative one and make the max value two. And then we'll go back into the editor and then let's slide that lerp slider around again. And we should see, well, an unclamped version of it. There we go. So if we go to zero, we'll be at 50. If we go to one, we're going to be at a hundred. But what if we go past one? Well, it's going to keep going up at that same scale. So every one value here, or every one on this percent, is going to be worth whatever that difference is, so 50. So if we go to 1, it's 100. If we go to 2, it's 150. Now if we change the start to a 0, then the final value is going to be 2, because that range would be 100, and it would be 2 times that range. There we go, so we got 200. Did I say 2 or 200? I don't know. But there we go, we've got 200, and we can go down. If we go to the negatives, watch. We'll actually go to negative all the way down to negative 100 because that's the range there. So now you've seen lerp and lerp unclamped on a integer, but what about on some game objects that are actually moving around? This is kind of the case that I use it for a lot more often than an int. Pretty rare that I end up needing to lerp an int, but a position all the time. So here, let's take a look at our scene. In the scene view, we've got cube one, the, or sorry, that's cube two, that's end cube. We have our start cube at negative five, zero, 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 and zeroed on all the rotations. Our end cube is at four and negative four. So they're actually, uh, the camera is right over here. So this one's a little bit ahead and it's turned around. In fact, let's just rotate it a little bit different. Let's go to like a 120. So it's very obvious that it's rotated. You may have noticed that sphere automatically changed too. That's because what we're doing here is we're no longer just lerping a float. We're gonna lerp the position and the rotation here. So if I set this to zero, 
we're right at this thing's rotation and position. So right along the same, and we slide this up, I'll just grab it, I'm not using a range slider here, but you can see as I slide it up, the value goes up, actually let's just add a range slider, what am I doing? So here we'll add range, and I'm gonna go from zero to one, gotta get that F in there to make sure it's a float, and very obvious that it's a float, and then once we get the slider here, we'll slide it back and forth, and just watch as the thing moves along, and then I'll jump right back over to that code that I just kind of quickly showed. So here at zero, it's at the first object, the start cube's position and rotation. And as we move, it's slowly getting closer and closer to the second point. At point five, it's halfway in between them, and the rotation is halfway in between the two rotations. And then we go like that and keep going all the way to one, and we're now at the rotation of this box and the position of that box. So let's look at the code again. Here you'll see it's basically the same, except instead of a float, we're using a transform and another transform for our end cube, and we have this same lerp percent. And then in our update, we're setting the transform position to vector 3lerp and we give it the start position, which is a vector 3, the end position, and that lerp percent. This is just like when we we're doing math f.lerp, but we're doing it for vector 3, and it's going to give us back the vector. It's essentially going to lerp on all three of those values. And then we do the same for the rotation. So if I scroll over here a little bit, you see we're setting transform.rotation to quaternion.lerp, because rotations are in a quaternion. We give it the start rotation, the end rotation, and a percent again. And that lets us do that rotation of the, the spinning that we had there. And if I turn this cube, I just want to point out like I can move this thing way down there, maybe even rotate it totally different. Let's just kind of mix this thing all up. And then I grab that spear again and start sliding it and you see it's going to slowly kind of fix all those out and go back towards the source and the end and back and forth. So I think that this is something that every Unity developer should know about. I've seen people try to recreate this functionality and it's already just built right in there. And I wanted to share it because every time I use it, there are always a couple questions about like, what is that? How does it work? And um, how can I use this to make my code simpler, easier to read and just work better? So. Here it is. That's it. Um, if you like this thing, don't forget to subscribe, share, hit the alert thing, like, all that stuff. And uh, thanks for watching. And uh, I think that's it. Bye.